Okay, so recording. Great, I, I don't need the recording file, please. Yes, <laughs> okay. Uh, morning, good, good morning. So it's our great honor to invite uh, Professor uh, Marcello for the distinguished uh, seminar to us. Professor uh, Marcello is a very, very famous professor uh, in the area of uh, uh, power electronics, power systems, smart grids, and uh, artificial uh, in intelligence. So it's great. It's uh, it's, for, it's uh, our honor to invite uh, Professor uh, to have a seminar here. So the topic is uh, uh, the topic is uh, artificial uh, intelligence in the control of uh, renewable energy systems. Okay, so let's join together to welcome Professor uh, Professor Marcello's uh, uh, seminar. Welcome. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Professor Huizang, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and uh, talk to students and any colleagues you may have here in the in the in the guest lecture. I will share my screen and I start from uh, from my uh, lecture there. Okay, thanks. Uh, I ask everyone to please uh, uh, ask me questions at the end because this is a kind of uh, seminar. So it would be better to, my gosh, I'm seeing a fox with a bird in his mouth. Yes, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I'm sorry to do that, but I hear in front of my window, I saw the fox with a bird. <laughs> very, very fun. Okay, life is around us, isn't it? We are here working and talking about power electronics, but the animals are hunting. <laughs> okay, so it's a pleasure to be here. And in the beginning, I, I make a little bit of presentation for our research group. And then I go into the technical details and you can ask me questions at the end because this is a seminar. So when it's a class, of course, or when it's a project meeting, it's uh, it's nice that people interrupt. But I, I prefer that you take notes and maybe ask me questions at the end. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen and it should be here, yeah. Okay, just a minute. Because I need to put in slideshow here. I hope first that everybody hears me. So, you know, I'm gonna ask you to do something, ask my, my, my students, okay? Do thumbs up electronically because then I know that you are there alive with me. Thumbs up, thumbs up electronically. I need your reaction. Some reactions. Wow, thanks. Great. I see that you hear me and you are there. Thank you. Okay, so now I minimize my Zoom uh, dialog box so I'm not seeing you. And uh, I know there is uh, something on the chat, but I'm not reading the chat. Okay, so this is uh, regarding my talk today. And uh, I was already introduced by our host. Uh, I work at the uh, University of Vasa in the School of Technology and Innovations in the Electrical Engineering Department. I was hired here in a position to be a professor in flexible and smart power systems. And a little bit about our school. In the School of Technology and Innovations, we, we have several programs, uh, even though we are in Finland. Our school is international. That means uh, we are bilingual and uh, the official languages of the school are Finnish and English. Uh, the graduate, pro the postgraduate program, because we say graduate programs more in the United States and Canada, but the postgraduate programs, uh, they are in English, all the materials, applications, course. And we have here, as you see uh, with uh, the boxes, the programs that I am more involved uh, in my group, a master's program in smart energy and a doctoral program in technical science, okay? And uh, we have this 
master program in smart energy, where we uh, have applications from many places all over the world. It's very strong here in Finland as well, in Scandinavia. It's completely new. Uh, it started in 2019. So when I joined here, they already had <clears throat> the master program in energy, in smart energy. And that's what uh, we power electronics people understand as a smart grid. But we are talking also a little bit about flexible energy, energy transition. So it's a little more encompassing than only the power electronics aspects. We have um, uh, several blocks. Those are details of the uh, smart energy program, smart and flexible energy system, digitalization, and business. So the school here is very strong in economics, finances, and business. And we have a very close cooperation with them. So we have courses and we have projects that also involve, uh, for example, digital economy, circular economy. Those would be the course in our smart energy in uh, master. Uh, you have to choose uh, those courses. So you see by the titles that they are, they are like similar to what we understand as power electronic and power systems. And uh, uh, let's see the next one. Yeah, we have another one. We have uh, other courses in different, uh, how to say, uh, knowledge domains. I'm teaching this one here, Artificial Intelligence for Smart Power Systems. I published a book. I will show you the cover of the book at the end of this uh, presentation. And uh, the presentation today is based on my book, of course, because I use my book to teach my course. So what you're seeing today is uh, maybe one or two uh, lectures I have in applications of uh, power electronics and power systems using AI. And you also have business here. So you see here the uh, core of the program. Those would be the instructors. Uh, I'm here, and you have see you see here my other uh, colleagues. Uh, they teach, they do research, and we work together. Uh, those are research teams. Uh, the research teams means that we have projects, uh, funded projects, funding opportunities uh, with those, uh, uh, how to say, team focus areas. We may have uh, teams working in specific projects in specific papers or presentations or lab experimentation. One is flexible energy resource. Another one is <coughs> smart grids. We have cooperation with several other schools. Uh, this is our school, University of Vaza. We have uh, VENC. It's a local school here in Vaza. We have a very close cooperation with them. We have joint labs. And we have a few other schools in Finland. Uh, and we have uh, energy companies. Uh, Vasa is in a region. And that region uh, has a lot of uh, important uh, companies in technology, in uh, electrical power systems, energy conversion, manufacturing. You see here ABB, it's a, a kind of famous, Hitachi, Danfoss, uh, and a few others. For example, Wartzilla is a very strong group. Uh, we have the local utility, and Merinova is a technology company that we have here in our school. So this would be a presentation of uh, my school, uh, trying to motivate you if you think to apply maybe for uh, studies here or research here, and now we begin. So now would be the official beginning of our lecture. Renewable energy-based generation is shaping the future of power systems. We can look back to the past uh, 200 years and see how our society, which uh, we say modern, contemporary, but this uh, has been on for 200 years, since the industrial revolution when we had the industrial revolution in the 19th century so we start the mechanization 
uh, of uh, uh, systems, okay, using machines. Uh, we learned this in school. We know the importance of the Industrial Revolution. And in the 20th century, we had a technological revolution because in the 20th century, in order to modernize the Industrial Revolution, we had the evolution of uh, electrical power systems, electrical engineering, electronics, information, artificial intelligence, computers, computer science. So it's so diverse just to talk about the technological evolution of the 20th century. I have been working in a timeline where I try to aggregate what happened since uh, 1840 or 1844, if I'm not wrong, when the first entry in my timeline is uh, Bull, okay, George Bull, because we know the Boolean logic. He wrote a book called uh, Investigations of Thought. It's a long title, I don't remember now. <clears throat> But when we talk about the Boolean logic, we have to go back in history and see that Bull was trying in 1844 to try to understand how our, how our brain works with logic. Eventually, of course, his logic became very important for something that happened 100 years after he wrote that book, which was the invention of the computer uh, based on, uh, on a model that one of the things is to use uh, Boolean logic. So uh, I start with there and then I, I, I work along three timelines. Uh, uh, one is uh, computer uh, engineering, computer systems. Another one is in electrical engineering. And another one is artificial intelligence. There is an intertwined relationship with this. And we see how the uh, technology evolved a lot during the 20th century, and now we are in the 21st century. We are established in technology, still doing uh, big leaps and big developments, but we can say that we have established technology. The technology uh, revolution, the technological revolution will happen, and maybe still happening, but now we have to think on something that is very important for the survival of humankind and for the generation that is ahead of us because we have to have a sustainable world. A sustainable world needs a sustainable and resilient energy. So in the 21st century, we are working here on the energy transformation. Hopefully, the energy revolution. Energy revolution of the 21st century. That's what we need to provide as a path for us, for our children and our grandchildren and our students, okay? We have to have access of electric power resource provided by the nature, sustainable and renewable. Solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, they should be distributed, they should be flexible. And we have to have inclusion of all people. More than 2 billion of people in our planet, they do not have access to electricity, okay? More than that, may not have access to the minimal way to have a uh, decent and sustainable life, okay? So electricity is very important. We have to develop energy solutions that are sustainable, inclusive, and socially fair. If you look here on my right, you see uh, the vertical axis is the production in energy. The horizontal axis, uh, it's a uh, time here. And you see a uh, visualization of resource because we're digging the earth to build what's on the top of the soil. We are digging the soil to extract what we have there. And then on the top of our soil, we build what we leave and what we use. So we need all sorts of resources and minerals. 
And uh, you see here that we have a lot of coal. Coal may not have peaked yet, but will be, and will last longer than the other resource. But you keep digging and digging and digging, we are gonna also end with the coal. May take 200 years, may take 300 years. We don't know, okay? But you see the other ones, everybody talk about uh, nuclear power. So amazing nuclear power, huh? But nuclear power is also fossil fuel, eventually. Why fossil fuel? Because you have to, you have to take a mineral from the earth and you have to process the mineral to make it as a fuel, okay? So it's not fossil fuel because it didn't came from fossil, but it's on the same idea, it's a mining, it's something that you have to mine, you have to dig. So uranium, as more as we talk or any nuclear resource, is gonna quickly die down. There are calculations that if you use, if we convert all the electrical power in the world to nuclear power plants and do not use any other uh, fuel, the uh, uh, uranium and all the uh, nuclear fuel will be depleted in two years. So if we power the whole world with uh, nuclear power plants, two years, it's all gone. Of course, we're not powering the whole world, okay? But see, uh, we expect the even the cycle of the nuclear fuel to come to an end as oil, as gas. So you see here our path. Our path is this straight line, alternatives. We have to have initially a mix, of course, with all this coal, uranium, oil, and gas. But then we have to replace and displace. And then we have to have better efficiency, uh, more hydro, uh, power plants or when we can have hydro power plants and then we can have what is renewable okay whatever comes from sun or whatever comes from the heat of the sun or whatever we can use but do not deplete okay so power electronics and ai they would uh, help this and they will uh, allow smarter power systems a microgrid or a smart grid is uh, very important because it allows the intermittent nature of renewable energy to be compensated. Uh, could be compensated by storage, could be compensated by cycling, one solution versus another one. Maybe you have a place where you have a lot of wind at night, and during the day you have a lot of sun. So uh, seems uh, plausible that we have a hybridization of wind energy versus photovoltaics, okay? Maybe you have places where you can dig the soil and you can use uh, uh, the surface that we have below us as a very high, capacity storage, okay? Because uh, 10, 15, 20 meters down in the, in the excavation, we have a constant temperature, which is the average temperature that you have in that particular region, okay? So you can use that for <clears throat> HVAC, heating, air conditioning, and ventilation. <clears throat> we can use it for uh, exchanging uh, heat uh, with uh, buildings. We can use it for electricity production with uh, heat pumps, or maybe combine cycles with low gradient uh, Kalina cycle, for example. So we have to develop solutions that will be permanent, reliable, resilient, sustainable and flexible. <clears throat> in that regards, we need power electronics integrated with power systems. We need control systems and automation. We need uh, also artificial intelligence because we want to explore the capabilities of how computers can respond 
to flexible needs using algorithms that can be developed to provide um, how to say a very adaptive needs to whatever is happening in that system <clears throat> artificial intelligence uh, means that we're going to have uh, real-time simulations and we're going to have energy conversion the artificial intelligence based control system is uh, an approach to help complex systems to operate in a way that we have them in optimal and secure conditions. So you see here something that I have been uh, talking for the last uh, 10, 15 years of my life. In the past, power electronics uh, groups were not really working together power systems because power systems would work to what uh, the utilities uh, need, what we need for uh, generation and transport of energy and power electronics would be how we use that for appliances and for systems. So we see here the core competence for power electronics, the core competence for power systems. However, to work in a smart grid, we have to overlap. We have to have overlapping skills. So when I work with my students, when I work with uh, my teams and faculty members and staff, I try to make uh, a reality that we overlap those skills. We don't have a power electronics perspective versus a power systems perspective. We have a unified view of power electronics enabled power systems with uh, intelligence and real-time control. We can make this as a microgrid. We can make this as a smart grid. <clears throat> so in Universal Vasa, the research paradigm is to have a unified smart grid power systems, power electronics, power quality, and renewable energy systems. It's a key also to control microgrid bidirectional power flow. <clears throat> When I teach my course, I usually take maybe two or three weeks just to work on the topics of this slide because we have to understand how we have DC microgrids and AC microgrids and hybrid microgrids, how we can control power flow and what we need to have intelligence to make it how to say a better and more comprehensive solution. So we may use uh, machine learning, we may use uh, probabilistic methods, we may use uh, fuzzy logic, neural networks, we may use uh, multi-agent systems, we may use deep learning, which is, uh, has been a very important tool on the past 10 years. But the idea is to have a encompassing solution to allow microgrid by direction power flow to become a smart grid and integrate those renewable energy into systems for the use of our society. In the past, <clears throat> we know that the grid was simple. I have here three figures, they, they go one after the other. I go quickly, but when I, when I usually go into more details in a class, for example, in a course, I tried to explain how was the grid in the past. That was very simple, unidirectional. Uh, the power would flow from the main power plant to the users, and the system operator just needs to use some telephone calls, some simple modem connections. But that that was the past. Okay. In the present, we have have uh, had since um, the sixties, nineteen sixties a lot of uh, automation we call SCADA and they're going to have a distribution control center a transmission control center they have some uh, signals communication here we control more the substations and we have uh, some kind of uh, distributed generation and a little bit of renewable energy integration so this is the, pre the present, uh, the original centralized structure of our power grid has been evolving 
on the past 30, 40 years. Uh, and we are uh, in this present towards the future, the next slide. The next slide here is the future. In the future, in some cases, we may have networks like this, but we are working for this future. We're going to have a network of communications, controls, computers, automations with new technologies and tools. So a way more, uh, how to say, uh, controllability with computers and microcontrollers and RISC microprocessors, a way more integration of uh, solar and wind with smart grid integration for local storage and net metering with uh, photovoltaics, uh, with uh, heat recovery. Uh, we're going to have uh, in this uh, future that's already uh, a reality now, energy service providers, we may able to have contracts with these energy service providers to have visual power plants, for example, uh, where we have uh, to change our mobility with electric cars and electric cars, pretty much, we are driving a power plant uh, in four wheels. Okay? When we we'll use an electric car, we are driving a system that has wheels, so you can move around and have a steering wheel and the wheels to, to move you on the road. But that car is uh, maybe 50 kilowatts, 80 kilowatts, 100 kilowatts. Okay? So it could be a hybrid car. You can have a small uh, ICE with uh, an electric machine and you have batteries so you can charge in your house, go to your home, to, to your friend's place and recharge there maybe uh, or to your, to your office. And if it's necessary, you can plug your car and provide power to yourself to your neighbors, to the utility, and maybe inject some power into the grid and get some money back in your account, okay? That would be a way. So applications of fuzzy logic neural networks and power electronics and power systems would be what I'm talking about here, where we have some examples and applications of fuzzy logic neural networks. Unfortunately, would be my pleasure, but in this uh, seminar, because I only have 15 minutes or one hour maximum. Uh, I cannot teach you fuzzy logic and neural networks and deep learning. For this, you'll need a whole course. The course uh, would take uh, minimum 10 weeks or 12 weeks, depends on how the course is organized. And with two classes and several homeworks and exams and final projects, okay? So it needs really preparation to understand what you need to develop fuzzy logic neural networks. Of course, you can go in MATLAB and you have two box. You can use Python. There are so much available as uh, open source, but I'm just gonna talk about some applications. But before I go into the applications, some principles. When we want to optimize, I want to probably go into a certain um, index and find the maximum, or could be find the minimum. Okay, for example, if you want to optimize cost, you're not gonna maximize the cost; you're gonna minimize the cost. Okay, but when, when you want to optimize efficiency, you want to maximize. Okay, so sometimes you want to maximize something, sometimes you want to minimize something, and to be very clear, optimization may mean different things for different people. Okay. If you talk to power systems uh, people, they have optimization, they have uh, large uh, linear models with uh, big matrices. Uh, but sometimes an optimization in that case means uh, a study of a particular solution that would be considered to be the best <clears throat> and then implement. And then you do the optimization one time. But sometimes you have to do the optimization uh, all the time, okay? I'm looking outside and I see the trees uh, moving around with the wind, okay? So there is wind outside. So it would be a good day today for wind turbines to operate, okay? But the wind will go up and down, will fluctuate, we'll have some 
vortex, we have some uh, going up and coming down uh, profiles. And I want my turbine to extract that maximum power all the time. So I need an optimization all the time, okay? So this is what we call peak power tracking. Particularly for renewable energy, we want to get the maximum power available for the renewable energy. Because uh, if you do not lose it, if you do not use it, you lose it, okay? So when the wind is flowing, you have to extract the maximum power because maybe in 10 minutes, there is no more wind. So you want to extract that maximum power right now, okay? Sometimes you want to maximize efficiency. For example, fuel cell, if you maximize the power, you're gonna use more hydrogen. And maybe you don't want to use a lot of hydrogen, but you want to maximize the efficiency of your fuel cell. So in some cases you want to maximize power. In some cases you want to maximize efficiency. In some cases, you want to minimize losses. That depends, okay? So when you have a pump, for example, and you want to pump water in a storage, uh, you want to pump the maximum amount of water, but you want to minimize the power that you need for that, okay? So maybe you have some valves, some actuators that you change, you change uh, uh, the throttle of that water pump. So we want to, uh, to pump the maximum amount of that fluid, but you want to minimize the electrical power you need for that. So you have to optimize your benefits or maybe minimize your efforts, okay? When you optimize your benefit or minimize your efforts, you are doing something that is a heuristic way to search this. For example, if you are walking in, in a hill and you want to see the horizon, okay, because maybe on the horizon there is a nice uh, uh, sunny beach that you want to go there to swim. So we're gonna go up and up and up, okay, until you see your horizon, then Maybe you are so tired that you do not want to go to the beach. So only by seeing it's fine. Okay? If you want to go to the beach, your, your benefit would be arriving there. But if you want to go to the peak, you may stop there, enjoy the view. Okay? So you have to define what's your benefit for your effort. But we can always say that when you do something, you have an effort. So if the last change in your effort has caused your output that you want to increase, then keep moving, keep doing the same thing. If your output decrease, you don't see the beach anymore or you are lost and you are not really reaching there, you go in the backwards direction, okay? So there is a heuristic way of this, okay? If the last change has caused the output to increase, keep moving. Otherwise you change because you want to move in the opposite direction. So we can use this to optimize renewable energy source. Power is the product of two variables. One is uh, uh, strength, another is flow, okay? Strength versus flow. Even in electrical circuits, okay? Strength versus flow could be a variable true and a variable across. Okay, so we know that in, in electronics, electrical power, electrical engineering, power is voltage multiplied by current. So I have a, a true variable with an across variable. So that is in any system, electrical, mechanical, any system. You have strength and flow. Okay. So uh, we have to define those uh, variables, multiply them, find the power, and then we want to maybe optimize that power, increase that power as much as possible. But because I'm multiplying two variables, I have a nonlinear relationship because multiplication is not linear, okay? So the maximization of power per se already, is already a nonlinear operation because it uh, depends on the multiplication of strength versus 
flow. Okay. So a typical power curve for an electrical generator is here. This could be an induction machine, a synchronous machine, but typically you have a maximum power and you have a current on the terminal of that machine that you go from zero to the maximum. And there is a peak of the maximum power of that electrical generator. Photovoltaic systems, uh, we, we can have uh, models to plot this. I have all the equations for that. So on the top, you see power versus voltage and power versus current. And uh, we know that what we want is to optimize the overall efficiency of a photovoltaic cell. So on the bottom curve, you see here typical solar irradiation, uh, where uh, as the solar intensity goes up and down, the curves will go up and down. And as the temperature changes uh, higher and lower, I also have a variation here. So you see that the maximum power that would be this hyperbola here will change from A to B to C. That means this straight line, which would be a load line, will change. So, I have to find the best operating power in a solar cell by changing the load line. That means I have to have a system that will emulate what's the best load. What does this remind? This takes me maybe two more classes, two more lectures in a course that we have an internal system. That internal system will require, require a certain impedance at the output. And that impedance could be controllable, maybe with a converter, and I want to optimize the power. We know from Thevenin equivalent that when you have the equivalent Thevenin of something, the maximum power will happen when the output load is equal to the series uh, resistance, the series impedance. Okay? When it's an impedance, you have to consider the complex conjugate. When it's real, it's only the resistance. So uh, if I can model a renewable energy system with an equivalent Thevenin, the source will be the place or the voltage. It usually is a voltage uh, equivalent Thevenin. And uh, is where the, the power is coming from, okay? Sun or hydrogen or wind. And then the equivalent series resistance will vary depending on the operating condition. So I need to change the load, okay? I need to find every time equivalent terminal and match with a controllable load. It's like an impedance matching, okay? Fuel cell systems are here. We can have, uh, see, this is the voltage of the fuel cell and the efficiency of hydrogen through the electrical power pretty much follow the same curve, okay? So that means I have the maximum efficiency here, and then the efficiency will go down and down. The power will go up and up. So when you want to optimize a fuel cell, you may have a hybrid uh, algorithm that will, in one hand, optimize the power, on the other hand, optimize efficiency. So I would like to actually stay around here, okay? Because if I stay here, I have a lot of power with very low efficiency. So that means I use too much hydrogen, okay? If I stay here, I have a high efficiency, but I have a, a low power going to the output, okay? This would be for air-based, micro turbines, HVAC, compressed air energy storage. Uh, we have a surface like this that depends on the gas, depends on the pressure depends on the operating point. So we have to track in this system, the maximum efficiency, okay? So in this case, we have impedance-based controls. And impedance-based controls, we can make a lot of algorithms using fuzzy logic and neural networks to optimize many things, uh, demand side, energy management, uh, batteries charging, uh, battery selling power to, to the grid, 
we can uh, we can have multi-port power electronic converters that will will have in an integrated port several possibilities of flexible solutions and then you define depending on the hour of the day which solution is the best one to to restore the maximum power and maintain the overall efficiency of the system okay and you can use fuzzy logic okay so i use fuzzy logic in the past first time I used fuzzy logic for optimization was during my PhD and my PhD was uh, from 1991 to 1995 and when I did my PhD I was already with a few years of experience so I was not a fresh young student doing a PhD I had a family my kids so you see that pretty much I'm telling you that I'm kind of dated. <laughs> I have, <laughs> you can figure out my age by that. Okay. So from 1991 to 1995, when I studied in Tennessee with Professor Bose, who is still alive and he's a living legend in power electronics, we developed a fuzzy logic for the application of wind turbines. And later on, I applied for photovoltaics, I applied for fuel cells. So I made, I made several other applications after my PhD. But here we have how the wind, uh, wind will change from wind velocity 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13 meters per second. And how you have to find the point of the maximum power. If I have torque and speed is a, ver is a variable uh, true is a variable true with a variable across. So the multiplication is a power, so it's a hyperbola. I have to find the locus of the maximum power, okay? And I'm gonna skip this. Uh, this is optimization using Homer. Energy conversion, we have this possibility, unconstrained versus constrained. And uh, we talk a lot about these in courses, if you're gonna use heat. If you need a system that will serve as a function approximation, will serve as a feedback control, or you serve as system optimization. Okay? In my book, I describe in the chapters of my book uh, how to understand, develop, and implement fuzzy logic, neural networks, two types. Uh, pretty much feed forward and competitive and deep learning for these three possibilities where for one we can construct a model using heuristics or numerical data for two we can have a negative feedback control so we have a set point and then i have a measurement and i have to provide a control in a closed loop control for that system to operate. Or I may have an online search for parameters and systems conditions that will maximize or minimize a given function. I have been talking about this maximization and minimization needs in renewable energy systems and storage. Fuzzy logic and neural network techniques make the implementation of these three paradigms possible, make them robust and reliable in several practical cases. Okay, so, I will skip this because I just uh, look into my time and I don't have much time uh, now. Okay, so I, I will I will go in a few applications. And of course, all those applications I have in my book, I have in papers, you can study papers. Uh, after this uh, seminar, if you want to contact me, you can request connection with me on LinkedIn. I am available on LinkedIn. You can write to me via email if you have questions for further continuation in your questions. Okay. So, if you use fuzzy logic for induction motor control using vector control, this would be the application. I have here an induction motor with a sinusoidal pulse width modulation. I have a vector control here with IQ control and ID control, ID controls flux, 
IQ control torque, okay? So we have some sensors, we measure the speed, okay? And the fuzzy controller will compare the speed of the shaft with the reference, will give you the error, the error will be delayed by one sampling time, and then I, I calculate the change in error. So I multiply with again to be in PU. So I have error in PU, change in error in PU. So I'm gonna use this table here of error versus change in error to give me the variation of the output. The variation of the output is the variation of IQ that's integrated. So I have this. This is a typical fuzzy logic control operation. It has been tested, deployed, implemented since 1970s. Fuzzy logic was invented in the 60s, was deployed in Japan in the 70s, in China as well. So Japan and China were very important in the beginning for fuzzy logic in the 70s and the 80s because it was not yet accepted by, by the, how to say, the other side of the world, Europe and United States. And eventually in the 80s and 90s, it became a very important tool. You, you even have this, for example, in MATLAB. Okay. So this will be a typical rule. Uh, this, uh, we have rules. The rules will compare error and change and change in error to give a certain correction. Then we have membership functions that describe, uh, uh, that describe where in a certain domain I have the fuzzy sets to be uh, to be triggered by the inputs. So we have several papers in fuzzy logic control, sometimes making a PI, sometimes making a PD. Uh, fuzzy logic is still possible to use today, maybe not for really replacing a PI, but maybe for things that do not have a model, for example. I wrote a book in Portuguese about fuzzy logic. Uh, I never wrote it in English because there are so many books in English about fuzzy logic. But in Brazil and Portugal, countries that speak Portuguese, it's uh, well adopted and has been selling for more than 20 years. So I, I know of application of fuzzy logic in many places, in addition to a simple PI in scheduling aircrafts, in managing hospitals, in uh, business and finances. There are so many applications of fuzzy logic. Here we have a similar control using fuzzy logic for a wind turbine. We can have measurements and have a fuzzy logic controller on the top of my vector control to program my induction generator to have the best performance with the wind. I can use a neural network to control. You see here that I'm talking about controls, okay? Because I told you 10 minutes ago that we have three possibilities, okay? One is to make a model, another is to make a control, another is to make an optimization, okay? So I'm talking about controls. So I can have an inverse model with a neural network and I can, train my inverse model. Uh, and as I train my inverse model, I download the weights here. So here in this path, I have the inverse model that was trained of my plant. So it's always stable. Here, uh, I'm saying a DC motor because uh, I published a paper on this DC motor. Many people published on that because it's a simple system to design, but this uh, capability has been implemented in other situations that didn't have a model, okay? So this is a kind of an application of a model reference adaptive controller using neural networks. So this is again regarding the model reference adaptive control. We can use for online optimization, okay? Those are some old papers I had a long time ago, derived from my PhD for online optimization. I can use to optimize flux in an induction machine. So these I have to discuss machines, but as we, we have a machine with a converter, we decrease the flux component 
and then the air gap flux decreases and the state of current increase. So what happens is the total loss decreases initially, but because IS is increasing, I have more copper loss, so then it starts to increase. So there is an optimal point here. So when you have an induction machine in steady state, you can decrease the flux in order to reach the maximum efficiency, okay? So this would be how we do that. Uh, this is uh, if you have more details, they are in papers that I published. I can pretty much program the ID, the flux current of the vector control with fuzzy sets. And then I can apply into a grid connected system. I can discuss about aerodynamics of a wind turbine, about these curves that I discussed before. And then this would be the system. I have a double back-to-back -back converter with a DC link with a wind turbine connected to the grid with vector control for the machine with a modified vector control for the grid connected with power calculation in several places and several controllers. So there are six typical controllers here. In my original paper that I published a long time ago, I used three of those six possible possibilities. Those are the three ones. Fuzzy logic control one, fuzzy logic control two, fuzzy logic control three. Fuzzy logic control one is to optimize the power injected to the grid by programming the best uh, speed of the wind turbine. Fuzzy logic control two is to optimize the flux so when I reach the maximum power here, I use fuzzy logic control two to extend a little bit the efficiency. And fuzzy logic control three is like a PI control that is adaptive and will maintain my system stable against uh, turbine oscillations, wind vortex. So those are the fuzzy sets. We had experimental evaluation and a lot of things that were really developed. Okay, so I'm just skipping here because it's just an illustration of old experimental data. Okay, I can use fuzzy logic in neural networks for modeling and function approximation. For example, uh, you can use neural networks to estimate signals. Uh, I, I have a paper that I compare the DSP estimation of signals in a vector control versus neural network estimation. Uh, that paper was published a long time ago. Maybe several of you are not even born, maybe 1995. This was the neural network that I used before, okay. Today to build this neural network is a piece of cake. Okay? You just go to Python, uh, Keras, and you can make this network in 10 minutes of reusing code, okay? But I have to write everything in C language and implement in a DSP. So it was quite difficult that time. And then it took me days for training the neural network. We have all possibilities of AI, consumer load forecasting, forecast of wind and PV, diagnostics of faults, uh, many, many things here. For a wind farm, we can have monitoring protection and we can use artificial neural fuzzy inference intelligence system for wind farm health monitoring system. We have the wind signals and using a artificial neural fuzzy inference system, we can have a graphical user interface to help um, the, the system manager to understand how are the conditions of that particular wind farm. We can have artificial intelligence for control systems, okay? We can have adaptive plant modeling and neural networks. For example, I can use neural networks with delayed inputs, so I can capture the dynamics of that system. That's a very typical use. I just use a feed forward neural network here, okay, multi-layer perception with many inputs, and then I try to capture the variable that I want to help me to capture the dynamics, okay? So by delaying the inputs, I convert this delay tap line into a pattern recognition, 
Okay, this is a trick that we use on neural networks to do dynamics. Or we can also have a learning algorithm that uh, will predict the error of the artificial neural network in a plant. And then I can also have a feed forward neural network uh, tapped delay line to have this, uh, uh, this uh, possibility of control. I can have an adaptive inverse model as well. So I can have a system tracking with another one. So my plant will provide the inputs for my neural network, okay? And my neural network will have uh, a error prediction from the input of this. So I am defining the inverse. This is another way to do the inverse. And then when this uh, settles down, I copy the weights here. I have the inverse model and I can use that inverse model to control a very complicated system. Or I can use a reference model, okay? This reference model here is the one that I showed you before with the DC motor. This is my book, Artificial Intelligence for Smartphone Systems, Fuzzy Logic Neural Networks, has been published by IET. There are so many applications of fuzzy logic neural networks and power electronics and power systems. They are discussed in the book. We have uh, case studies, and there is still a lot you can do in your research for your academic uh, uh, purpose, okay? I discuss here several possibilities of application for the large neural networks. Coming back to my school, I work in a lab called Frazy Lab. Universal Vasa has our flexible renewable energy systems lab. Uh, we have several platforms for hardware in the loop, uh, OPOWER T, Typhoon, uh, several converters, inverters, protection relays. We have support from many industries. So we are doing uh, a lot of uh, research in this area of uh, power electronics enabled power systems, okay? Power electronics for integration renewables. In order to design a smart grid, you have to understand what you're doing. You have to have computational modeling software tools. You have to merge and unify computer science, data science, electrical engineering control systems. You can use deep learning. I didn't talk about deep learning today because we didn't have enough time. Uh, in deep learning, we have uh, two main streams possible today, depending on what kind of tools you select and elect to work. Um, the Universal Vasa is contributing for R&D and AI for smart power systems. Our students are empowered to design control systems and data analysis tools for integrating renewable energy systems into the utility grid. We want to make a smart grid as a legacy for our generations. Our researchers and laboratory facilities are aligned with the state of the art. We approach a unified methodology for analysis and designs of power electronics based design of power systems using real time control and hard in the loop capabilities. AI, fuzzy logic, neural networks, deep learning, they are a very coherent approach for advanced power systems. Our objectives here in our research group are in scope with the required modern design and smart grid power systems, power electronics, renewable energy, communications real-time control, cyber physical systems, and digital twin systems. If you're interested about uh, studies here, uh, those are some links. We have here a link for PSG, and maybe if uh, we have available, it's possible to apply for a one-year work or different scholarships. And this is the end of my presentation. I will stop sharing. Of course, I extend it over time.
okay. when I ask when I ask 15 minutes, I knew it could be one hour. <laughs> That's okay. So I'm I'm available for questions if you do have. Uh, can you talk about something about the CSC program? You mentioned in your email, so there's a CSC program. Can you talk about yeah. that? See, I don't know how this CSC program really works because I just heard from people who do it. I have a friend in France. I don't know if you know him, Professor Fegal. He works at UTBM uh, in Belfort Montbéliard, and he's uh, from China. He's uh, Chinese, but now he's French oh. also. So I was in China with his invitation and I was in Xi'an. When I was in Xi'an, I gave a talk for a conference. So I met professors there and then I went to Beijing. And uh, I have a friend also in Beijing, Tsinghua. Okay. Uh, so all of them told me, we have this okay. possibility here in okay. China where the good students, the top students, they can apply for this uh, fellowship. And when I was in Alborg, also with Professor Fred Blabiag and Joseph Guerrero, they had uh, all sorts of fellowships and possibilities. You know, they had their projects, they hired people, but they also had some Chinese who came there and they were hired by the government. So I know it's possible, and I'm asking if you know the way that your students who have this possibility to apply, maybe they could apply here. I talked to my administration, they are willing to have a better internationalization for our school, more relationships. So if there is uh, anybody here who would like to come to Universal Vaza, work in our Frazzy lab, either doing research, maybe you just want to do research for six months or one year, and then you come back to China, or maybe you come here for a full PhD and maybe you have our commitments with the Chinese government because you'll be funded. So maybe you have to return, I don't know. But we are open for conversations, we are open for dialogue. We can put our international relations people here from Universal Vaza in touch with the student or with your school, you know. So I'm open for this dialogue. I still do not know the path, but I would like to walk along this path and maybe have a nice cooperation with your school and your research and your students. Thank you, thank you. So what interesting work for the neural networks for the modeling and control. Is there any questions from the audience? You know, silence means that you understand everything. <laughs> or silence may mean that you didn't like anything. <laughs> no, 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 no. Could be uh, either one. <laughs> so we I'm open for any questions. Uh, we have some uh, students also working on the neural networks. So I think there should be some <laughs> questions. <laughs> questions? Yeah, maybe one student who is doing any neural network project could uh, make a mention of his or her project. And maybe we can, can have a simple question or I don't know, whatever you want. I'm, I'm open for any anything you want to talk now or debate. Yanhua, can you ask some question? This is a good opportunity to discuss with Professor Marcello, very, very famous professor. I see in the chat that some people are thanking. I, I'm very happy also to be here and to give this presentation. If you don't have questions, it's fine. Sometimes people do not like to be on a cold call, but you can write to me, to my email, or you can go into LinkedIn and uh, ask me as a con as send me a connection. And then you can write there anything. If you're interested in studying or doing research here, Talk to professor who is young first because he is your professor there in our school, and then we this figure out how to do it. Just some yeah, question on the uh, right hand side. You can you check the diagram? Just some questions. Uh, oh, 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 here. Are there any plans to offer the masters online? 
Ah, uh, yeah, we we have a few courses online because now with COVID, a lot of people had to teach online. You know? For example, in my case, I joined the University of Vaz in September. So I am a new professor here. I'm here for eight months only. And I taught my course from January through first week of April. And my course was completely de delivered over Zoom. Okay. Of course, Zoom is still what you're doing here. We, we make share presentation and everything. So it's not really a online mode because to me, our online mode, uh, we really have available the videos and we have time for discussions and we have an online interaction as well that should be asynchronous, okay? I have done some uh, workshops in the United States in how to design a synchronous course. There are platforms for that. EDX is one platform. Coursera is another platform. There are so many platforms, okay? We can also use uh, Moodle, for example. I don't know if you use Moodle in your school. But uh, our school here is going along the online delivery. So far, we have the, how to say, the COVID solution. That's Zoom with interactions and maybe using a Moodle. But it's not completely asynchronous. But everybody here is talking about having online programs in the near future. I see, I see. So for the uh, distinguished seminar, the, one of the main uh, objective is to maybe to find some uh, 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 collaborations with you. So do you mind if I uh, share some slides? So uh, just uh, go ahead. Sure. About, uh, yeah. That would be wonderful. <laughs> I also want to learn from you. Great. Go ahead. Okay. So, Professor uh, Marcello, so my name is Hui Zhang. Uh, so this, and uh, we are, uh, I'm now in uh, Beihang University. Okay, I can share. Oh, here's my education. So I got my PhD in uh, Canada. So with Professor Yang Shi. And uh, after that, several years uh, in uh, OSU, Ohio State. Uh, but uh, not, not so far from uh, uh, Colorado, right? <laughs> And then I moved, I moved to Beihang University. Now, uh, as you mentioned, you are quite familiar with Beijing, right? So Beihang University is uh, located in Beijing, uh, quite close quite close to Tsinghua and, uh, and the Peking uh, University. So Beihang University is uh, for the, uh, the rankings top, uh, maybe top uh, 200, but in China, uh, is uh, ranked maybe top uh, twenty uh, and the top ten in engineering. So it's f it's famous for the uh, engineering. And uh, for the research in our our group, we are working on the design and control for um, autonomous vehicles and uh, vehicle uh, dynamics. So here's an examples for the controllers, uh, different types of controllers. Uh, this for fuel cell, for fuel cell uh, vehicles. This is for traditional traditional vehicle, and we also designed uh, many different type of uh, autonomous vehicles, such as this one, education education autonomous vehicle. So we have a lot of uh, basic functions just to show how to use the radar, how to use the map, how how to control the vehicle, and a lot of uh, example insight. And uh, this one is on man John uh, carrier, so we can we can uh, this is also used for many applications and for the mining vehicles. So we can see from here the node there is a driver here. So this is a totally new design. We don't have the driver and we don't have the steering system. It is it is uh, it's a new design. And uh, this one all man detail vehicles. And this is the uh, one of our uh, research. But for the for the controller design, so you you, you talked uh, you talked a lot on the fuzzy logic and the neural networks. Uh, because for vehicle dynamics, we also have a lot of nonlinearities. So it's also a nonlinear typical nonlinear system. So uh, I think we are we can we can try it to find some uh, uh, collaborations on how to control the uh, vehicles 
by using the fuzzy logic uh, and the neural networks to handle the nonlinearities inside. So this, uh, I think, is uh, one of the possible uh, collaborations. <coughs> Second one, we also uh, uh, work on the available devices. So uh, when I was in Canada, I did some research on the on the biomedical. So for the first year of my PhD is biomedical engineering. So I uh, developed several algorithms to so, so how to how to measure how to measure the uh, blood pressure, uh, how to ma uh, measure the heart rate, just to use the uh, valuable device. That is uh, many years ago. But uh, uh, when I uh, returned back to China, we tried to uh, design some sensors. Uh, These uh, sensors we can totally follow sensors algorithms uh, to uh, to the uh, uh, ABB and this some uh, products. Also, we have uh, initialized uh, two companies, one for the vehicle vehicle applications, and another one is for the uh, biomedical sensors. So uh, currently, the both companies are quite good. So totally, uh, avenue is more than 60 million US dollars. And we can see this is uh, the company, the, the picture picture view. So we can see the vehicle, we are the autonomous vehicles here, and the we we developed a, a big uh, uh, platform. This uh, maybe uh, can call the cloud uh, cloud based control cloud cloud based control platform. We can control each uh, vehicles. Uh, we can control each vehicle, and uh, we can monitor everything of the vehicle. And uh, so we can uh, we can do the research based on this uh, very very good platform. So currently there are more than. Uh, more than 3,000 uh, vehicles are collected to this, to this uh, platform. And uh, based on the research, we, uh, we also published uh, a lot of papers, uh, so more than 100 and the two books. One is for uh, iSphere, so modeling dynamics and control of electrified uh, vehicles. And uh, the papers, uh, most of the papers are published on the IGE journals, uh, such as TMAC, uh, TIE, and uh, the papers uh, can we have received uh, many citations. Now it's more than uh, six thousand. And uh, besides the papers, we also issued uh, a lot of patents. So forty more than forty and uh, forty-three patents. And uh, we have received uh, many projects uh, from the government now. Uh, as, a, as a PI, there are more than uh, there are 11 projects. The, uh, the budget is uh, around 50 million US dollars. Uh, this some publication service, uh, service for the uh, CBS, uh, HV CBS, uh, for the SAE, and uh, the AE for the journals, uh, a lot of journals, three HV journals, and uh, uh, four, four to five ISVU journals. Uh, also, I got some international awards, such as the Best Paper Award of IGB, uh, VTS, Best Paper Award of IGB General Father Assistance. So, quite close, right? Was <laughs> Father Assistance. And we have many collaborations uh, with the uh, Canada, uh, Canada uh, Canadian University, uh, US uh, can, uh, University from USA, and the Milan Injection Crime Field University, so uh, Australian universities. So uh, wish we can we can <laughs> find some collaborations with you in Finland. So here's these are some basic information from our site. So we are actually we can we can use the fuzzy logic and the neural networks for our vehicles. Very interesting. Uh, I in Brazil I was involved with mechatronics from oh. 1988 because we start uh, programming mechatronics, and that programming mechatronics became a degree, and then it became a department. And during this mechatronics time of my, my life, I was absent 
from Brazil to do my PhD. I was uh, I was not even a master degree when I joined the mechatronics group. I, I finished my master when I was an instructor in mechatronics. After my PhD, I came back to Brazil in 1906, 1996. And then I worked until 2000 in this mechatronics department. But I left Brazil, of course, and I left mechatronics behind. But uh, it's a little bit part of my, my life also as a career. I, I also have a degree in mechanical engineering in addition to, it's a doctor of science degree plus my PhD. So, I have a little bit of, uh, how to say, resonance with mechatronics, and uh, I, I don't, I don't do this uh, research per se anymore. But uh, I have some alignment. So very nice what you presented, and uh, your wearable uh, device for bioengineering is also very interesting, very nice. Uh, uh, would be nice to collaborate. Here we are trying to, in addition to work with power electronics, power systems, energy storage. I am doing something here that I, I, I like a lot. Uh, I, I love wood, I am a woodworker. So okay. I got in touch with people here about this and then we are working in a research project that will try to capture data from wood. Could be data on the forest, could be about, I don't know, pictures of the fibers could be about how the wood is transported, stored, and how they become constructions. And then you, we are going to try to identify using pictures, measurements, data, things like that, you know, and information on this chain to maybe improve the reuse and reutilization of wood using artificial intelligence. So we're gonna develop uh, fuzzy models, we're going to develop uh, neural networks for something that's not even related to power electronics, but I believe is important because if we, if you think of sustainability, everything is connected, you know? Yeah. So the energy that we use, the energy we produce is connected to our environment. So we cannot just uh, think uh, in electronics. We have to think as a society as a whole. So I believe the sustainability of force and wood is very important as well. So, and machine learning and artificial intelligence can help that. So I'm involved with that. So it'd be nice to work with you, Hui Zhang, and I hope we can have some collaboration, maybe papers, maybe yes. exchange students, uh, maybe, maybe some research, maybe I hope you can send uh, a student to, to come here. We can start a collaboration, maybe some joint projects. I hope so. I really hope so. Okay, so uh, hope uh, maybe you can visit uh, Beijing. So in the near future, we I, we can invite you to here. So talk more about the new new networks. <laughs> so we are so yeah, interested no. in the new networks. New networks. I'm closing because I used to live. Uh, of course, I still have a, a home in Colorado, but now I'm in Finland, so I'm closer to you. Because when I left uh, Colorado to go to Xi'an was a very long, uh, very long yes travel <laughs> to go and come back. So. It was one week, oh. but I, I, when I was trying to get okay with my jet lag in China, I came back to Colorado. <laughs> so it was two weeks of, who am I, you know? <laughs> because, you know, when you start to get, okay, now I'm in China, now I'm in Beijing. Well, so nice, then you travel back. <laughs> but now I'm okay. closing because at least our time zone is only five hours. So yes, it's a yes. little bit uh, easier to travel now than when it was before. Okay, so many thanks uh, again. So let's, uh, many thanks again. So let's uh, uh, keep in touch and uh, I will email you for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the future. Okay, I will email you. Thank you. <laughs> and maybe, I don't know, in the near future, Maybe we can collaborate in a IES conference. I don't know. Anything yeah. that could put us together would be nice. You are very yes. active in IES. Please send me your recording file, okay? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much Thank for the invitation. Time.